Shalom. Shalom, everyone. Can you please take your seat? I want to welcome you to Herzl Nair Tamid and thank you all for participating in this incredibly important mitzvah commandment. When we come to honor someone we love who has passed on, should I use my rock star voice? Okay. No, seriously, in my teens, we couldn't afford um, microphones, so had to yell shalom welcome i'm it is a privilege to have been asked by the family to lead this service of mourning and consolation and uh, some beautiful things have been said about our beloved ren in incredible language that we heard this morning and so our focus now is to offer prayers and comfort for the family. And so what you are doing now is a very holy act. And I'd like to begin with a couple of songs. It just occurred to me, people don't have the... Oh, for goodness sake. Minor detail, excuse me. There aren't very many people will have to share. Thank you. But as the, the special sidurim for the um, minyan, the ritual of mourning, let me explain a little bit about that. The word minyan recurs, refers to the minimum number of people who must be present for a valid prayer service, and that number is 10. So I think we're good. Um, I want to start with a couple of songs that aren't in this sidul. Two songs that are very different one from another. If you know either of them, please sing with me. The first one is a song of anguish and hope. Kol haulam kulo gesher tsar meot Gesher tsar meot, Gesher tsar meot, Kol haolam kulo, Gesher tsar meot, Gesher tsar meot, Vehaika. All the world is just a narrow bridge, just a narrow bridge. Just a narrow bridge. All the world is just a narrow bridge. Just a narrow bridge. But above all, above all, is not to fear, not 
much to fear at all. But above all, above all, is not to fear at all. Kol haolam kulo gesher tsar mehod. Gesher tsar mehod. Gesher tsar mehod. Kol haolam kulo Gesher tsar mehod. Gesher tsar mehod. And now a song of joy and holiness written by Debbie Friedman. The time is now we've gathered round so bring all your gifts and bring all your burdens with you. No need to hide arms open wide we gather as one to make a makom kadosh. We come to tell, we come to hear, we come to teach, to learn, we come to grow. And so we say, the time is now. Sing to the one, God's presence is here. Shrina, you will dwell among us. We'll make this space a holy place. So separate, so whole, take comfort each soul who enters here. We begin our evening service on page 26. Hopefully some of you have access. We rise as we call ourselves to prayer. Barhu et Adonai Hamevorach Baru Adonai Morach Leolam Baed. On page twenty seven, you may be seated and let's read together. Praised are you, Adonai, our God, sovereign of space and time, which is what Melachaulam really means whose word brings on the dusk of evening together. Your wisdom opens the gates of dawn. Your understanding regulates time and seasons. The stars follow their appointed rounds in response to your divine will. You create day and night. You alternate darkness and light. You remove the day and bring on the night. You separate one from the other. We call you eternal of heavenly hosts. You are our living God. May you rule over us as you rule over nature. Praised are you, eternal, who brings the evening dust. El chai v'kan yoham, tamid yimloch aleinu leolam va'ed, baruch atah Adonai, hamarif aravim. Page 28. Ahavat olam Beit Yisrael Amcha ahavta Amcha ahavta Please continue silently. Vahavatiha Alta Sirmi Menuleola Mim Baruha Tadonai O Heva Mo Israel. Page thirty 
by Sheldon Zimmerman. My God, my soul's companion, my heart's precious friend, I turn to you. I need to close out the noise, to rise above the noise, the noise that interrupts, the noise that separates, the noise that isolates. I need to hear you again. In the silence of my innermost being, in the fragments of my yearning for wholeness, I hear whispers of your presence, echoes of the past when you were with me, when I felt your nearness, when together we walked, when you held me close, embraced me in your love, laughed with me in my joy. I yearn to hear you again. In your oneness I find healing. In the promise of your love I am soothed. In your wholeness. I too can become whole again. Please listen to my call. Help me find the words. Help me find the strength within. Help me shape my mouth, my voice, my heart, so that I can direct my spirit and find you in prayer. In words, only my heart can speak. In songs, only my soul can sing, lifting my eyes and heart to you. Adonai Svatai Tiftach, open my lips, precious God, so that I can speak with you again. I should have told you it's called a prayer for prayer. Page 38. Actually, we'll start with 39, the paragraph on the bottom, the reflections on Hashkivenu. This is the, one of the, the blessings between the Shema and the Amidah. Please let's read together on 39. Help us, O oh God, to lie down in peace and awaken us with confident trust for tomorrow. Strengthen those who are burdened with sorrow. Grant them patience, courage, and strength. Guide them, Adonai, with your good counsel. Direct them toward the path of serenity. Shield them, we pray, from every enemy, from fear, from anxiety, from despair. Help them to feel protected and sheltered, sustained even in grief by your compassion. Guard them this night and every night. Bless them with healing and hope. Help them, O Lord, to lie down in peace. Awaken them with confident trust for tomorrow. Ushmorze tenu, voenu le chaimu le shalom, meata de adolam, barucha ta donai, shomeramo Israela.
If it is your custom to rise for any of the Kaddish, whether it's the Chetzi Kaddish or the full Kaddish. If it is your custom to rise for the Chetzi Kaddish or the Kaddish Shalem, I'm about to do the Chetzi Kaddish on page 44. It kadal ve it kadash me rabba be al madi vrachiru te be am lich malchute be chaye ruviome u chaye de kol be Israel ba gala ba gala u vizman kari vimru amen yehesh me rabba me hora. Barach, we ish tabach, we it for arbitrum, we it nasse, we it a dar, we it a le, we it a lal, she made a good shabri hu, le ela, mink cold bitter kata, the shirata, tush the hat, the nehemata, da me run the awa, we meru. So Jewish custom <coughs> dictates that we do not sing the Amidah out loud in the evenings, just the mornings and the afternoons. So you will find the evening Amidah, the Mariv Amidah, starting on pages either 46 or 47, depending on how you like your first bracha. And it continues to page 58. Israel, Veimru, Veimru, Amen. 
Yase Shalom, Yase Shalom, Shalom Aleinu, Yalkol Israel. Yase Shalom, Yase Shalom, Shalom Aleinu, Yalkol Israel, Yalkol Haolam, Veimru, Veimru. our service fairly soon with the closing prayer, Aleinu, on page 62. I have a couple more readings, and then there will be a couple of people speaking. So the Aleinu, on page 62, invites us to imagine a world where everybody knows that every single person is created equal. And one of the things that I think about when I think of Rene Egnall is how that brilliant smile greeted everyone, no matter who you were, no matter what. And it's that kind of love that's going to get us through these times. So I invite you to rise as able for the Alenu on page 62 and 63. Alenu le shabeach la don ha kol la tet gedula li otzer breishit shelo asanu kegoye aratzot velo samanu kemishpechot ha adama shelo sam chelkenu kahem vegor alenu Kichol hamonam vanachnu korim uishtachavim umodim lifne melech malche hamlakim hakadosh baruch hu shenot hashemayim v'yosef eretz moshe v'kal v'shemayim v'shemayim. Page 64 in the middle. Kakatuv betoratecha Adonaiim loch leolam vaet venemar be seated. Tis a fearful thing to love what death can touch, a fearful thing to love, hope, dream, to be, to be, and to lose. A funny thing for fools this, and a holy thing, a holy thing to love. For your life has lived in me, your laugh once lifted me, your word was gift to me. To remember this brings painful joy. Tis a human thing, love, a holy thing, to love what death has touched. I invite you on page 67 to please read together the third reading, Roman numeral three on page 67, together. Eternal God, source of consolation and healing, your children's hearts are turned to you in this time of grief. Grant strength, O Lord, to those who mourn. Sustain them in their sorrow. 
Help them in their struggle to face the future, even as they continue to honor the memory of their loved one. As we recall the departed taken from our midst, we offer our thanks for the years which were shared, for the companionship which was enjoyed, for the love which was known, and for the memories which remain to be treasured. May we create living memorials through acts of kindness, of compassion, and of loyalty. May our bereaved find comfort in your unfilling love as they now rise to accept your love. Honors, please rise. That's the immediate family. Sorry. There are some who rise because that is the reform tradition, but at this point it is the mourners who rise, the immediate family. And Johnny, wherever you are, you can include yourself. Yit kadal v'yit kadashamei raba yalma divra Yeheshme Rabba Mivarach Lelamul Alme Al Maya Yit Barach Vish Tabach Vit Pa Arvit Koma Vit Nase Vit Adar Vit Ale Vit Ala Shme Bukucha Brihu Leila Min Kol Birchata Vishirata Tush Bachata Venechemata Damiran Bi Alma Vim Ru Amen Yehesh Rama Rabba Nin Shmaya Vichayim Alenu Vil Kol Yisrael Vim Ru Amen God, the place, the space of comfort you, of, co of comfort, comfort you. Amen. And you want to speak to us? No, I'm with all the attendants. By Alvin Fine. Birth. Birth is a beginning and death a destination, and life is a journey. From childhood to maturity, and youth to age, from innocence to awareness, and ignorance to knowing, from foolishness to discretion, and then perhaps to wisdom, from weakness to strength, or strength to weakness, and often back again, from health to sickness, and back we pray to health again, from offense to forgiveness, from loneliness to love, from joy to gratitude, from pain to compassion, and grief to understanding, from fear to faith, from defeat to defeat to defeat, until, looking backward or ahead, we see that victory lies not at some high place along the way, but in having made the pilgrimage stage by stage a sacred pilgrimage. Birth is a beginning, and death a destination, but life is a journey, a sacred pilgrimage to life everlasting. And I'd like to invite up friend Barbara. Do we have a last name? Barbara Cohen. If I can do this, guys. <laughs> Hi, Bobs. It's rain calling. Just checking in. Words I loved receiving on a voicemail message, and I will really miss. When Ant asked me to say a few words at Shiva, the first thing that came to my mind was that I would be talking about my forever friend. 
Lester and my relationship with Ant and Ren began in 1992 when they moved to Seattle and we knew right out the gate that we had found amazing people who would be our forever friends. We became very close very quickly and learned early on that we were also great traveling buddies. First just the four of us and then as life progressed and kids came along, we traveled as families and then again the four of us as empty nesters. Ren and I would sit and huck, and the guys would nap soaking in the sunshine. One day, the four of us were sitting in Mexico at the pool, and Ren was telling a story. The story was really involved, and at one point, she asked Lester a question, but there was no reply. Lester had fallen asleep with sunglasses masking his eyes, and Ren never let him forget that he was not paying attention. Anytime she told a story thereafter, she would tell Lester to remove his sunglasses and she would stop periodically to ask him if he was still tracking. <laughs> God forbid he might have fallen asleep because Ren knew all too well that Lester can fall asleep at the drop of a hat. Ren and I had many similarities and this helped forge our forever friendship. We both grew up in small towns in South Africa and tended to appreciate the small things in life. We loved the same style of clothing, to the point that one day we were talking about some clothes we had bought from a store in Seattle that we both loved. As we were describing our purchases, we discovered that we had bought the exact same dress in the exact same color. Any time that we would go out that season, I would give Ren a call just to double check that, were, that we were not both wearing the dress. Ren would, not, Ren would have been my go-to person for dress shopping for our son's wedding in November. But we never got to do that. So when Ren came home on hospice care, I asked if she would like to see what I had chosen to wear. But in all honesty, I needed her approval. Ren was very private. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I could not do it without her, and thank goodness she approved. Ren was very private, as am I, and knew that we could trust each other with whatever needed to be shared and became each other's confidants. Our love for baking is another trait we shared, and we would often exchange recipes that we tried with guests the previous Shabbat. Neither of us cowered from serving a recipe that we had never made before. I now have many recipes in Ren's handwriting and will cherish them forever. Our drink of choice was gin and tonic, and of course she introduced me to screwball, as she did to many. <laughs> Sip it slowly, she would say, and savor the taste. Ren had an amazing sense of humor. We would both laugh so hard that we would actually start crying with Ant and Lester shrugging their shoulders as they did not quite get why we were laughing so hard. Ren also loved good food, and in years gone by, we used to love to meet at Goldberg's for lunch and shared many a pastrami and chopped liver sandwich. Not many people would enjoy this combo, but again, another one of our similarities. We also enjoyed many spur of the moment, many spur of the moment cups of tea when in Bellevue or on Mosa Island. She just got me, and I got her, my forever friend. Did we have disagreements? Absolutely. But we always managed to talk through and resolve them. Another sign of a friendship that would last forever. Ren taught me to play Marge, and true to her generous nature, bought me my very own Marge set for my last birthday. As was mentioned this morning, she introduced me to some amazing people that she had taught, and we have been playing and will continue to play regularly to honor her memory. As Ren started down the path of a horrendous medical journey, I felt privileged to be there for her during this time and to be a part of her care team. <sighs> During her exhausting treatment and infusions, 
Sometimes we spoke, and sometimes there was silence. She knew I was there for her whatever she needed, and that was enough. In my heart, I thought that we would be friends forever and that Ren would beat this terrible illness. She was definitely a fighter and a warrior. I never in my wildest dreams thought I would be standing here today after being at her funeral. It just doesn't seem real. Ren had a couple of amazing expressions that became part of our special language. Some of you know these. Flate, flate, disturious eight. For the non-South Africans, this translates to, and there you have it, the story is done. And another one of my favorites is, Messiana Viesa nerves is klar. And this one translates to, my nerves, nerves are finished. I am at the brink. Her passion for life and her family, and of course her exe, was inspirational. She loved them all more than anything in the world. She used to tell me, Auntie is my rock. I used to sit there and that's what she would tell me. My heart bleeds for you and your L, Mark, Claude, Larry, and her dear parents, Top and V. When a loved one becomes a memory, their memory becomes a treasure. May the memory of Ren be a treasure to us all. She will be a treasure to me forever. But what is forever, without ever ending, eternally? Like the memory of her laughter, the love for her in our hearts will last forever, continually, incessantly, always. Ren might not physically be here with me, but there will forever be a place for her in my heart. You will always be my forever friend, and I will always love you dearly and carry you with me wherever I go. Rest in peace, my forever friend. Where to begin? Um, how do you summarize 40 years of knowing someone, 37 years of marriage? For someone who was so reserved and private, um, she sure knew how to draw a crowd, draw a crowd, because I cannot believe <laughs> the number of people that showed up today and here tonight, and I, I thank you all for attending. I'm not going to try to take you down an entire lifelong memory lane. You'll be here till well past midnight. But as you know, we arrived in 92, and those of you who met her as an adult may not know some of the, the background that I'm going to briefly try to summarize. In South Africa, when you go to medical school, it's not as in America where you have groups of sophomores and seniors and juniors mixing. You have a core group of people that you go through school with. And there were six guys that we started first year, and it's a six-year program. And one of the guys who now lives in Toronto, is a family doctor in Toronto, his name is Roy Blackovitz. And Roy Blackovitz was our bloodhound. He would find all the new fresh talent in town, bring them into the group. Uh, he was a very nice guy, but usually that was the last time he would date them because one of the rest of the guys would land up taking the girl out after that. Not very nice, but that was what happened in those days and one of the guys which was, has to be in 1983 had a 21st birthday and for an entire week we heard about this amazing girl that he had found in the radiation ther therapy department that he'd asked out to come to this 21st birthday party the problem is that Rene didn't really want to go with Roy to the 21st birthday party 
Now, her parents lived in a small town, as you heard earlier, called Parle, which was about an hour out of Cape Town, similar to, say, Tacoma. And when anybody asked her out, she would conveniently say, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot this is the weekend I'm going to be with my parents. Now, Roy was not to be undone. So when Rene came back with that line, Roy turned around and said, don't worry, I'll come and fetch you. <laughs> so she had no choice. She landed up coming with Roy to the 21st. I met her at the 21st because oh, I'd heard that whole week about this amazing girl. And soon after that, you know, she never went out with Roy. I went to Roy and said, hey, Roy, do you mind if I take Rene out on a date? And the rest is history, so to speak. Um, I'm not going to say it was all, you know, love at first sight and, and easy as any relationship. Um, Ren was a, was a feisty young lady and certainly gave me a run for my money. I was kind of a much more open kind of guy and didn't like to mess around too much and just, you know, showed my affection and she liked to play hard to get. Um, we never argued, you know, or fought in our earlier years. Uh, we would just have a disagreement. And whenever we had a disagreement while living in Cape Town, because her parents lived fairly close and her dad was, she was the apple of her dad's eye. I mean, she, she loved this Claudia and loved Larry, but they, they definitely had a special connection. And any time we had a disagreement or had a discussion, she would run home to the dad and what would the dad do? He obviously would take her side and pacify her and, you know, hold that thought for a moment, okay? Fast forward. We decide we're getting engaged, we're going to get married. We had, had the happiest, saddest wedding because at that point the military was after me. I refused to serve in the apartheid military and we decided we're leaving South Africa, wanted to come to America to specialize, but couldn't get the timing right. We actually got married twice in the same year, one for legal purposes, once the religious wedding. And two weeks later, as you heard earlier, the two of us packed a suitcase each and left for Larange, Saskatchewan. Many of those who know Canada, um, leaving beautiful Cape Town for northern Saskatchewan was a massive undertaking. Um, many of the f colleagues that left at the similar time as we did, marriages never survived. It was just too hard a transition without the family support. So we were committed to make things work, and I asked her, honey, please, can I just ask you, when we arrive in Larange, no tears, can it? just no, please, I, I know this is going to be hard, but do not cry. And as the planes got smaller and smaller, the face got longer and longer. And as you may have heard this morning, we literally landed in Larange. There was not an airport building. And, the, and the, the doctor that had hired me fetched us from the side of the plane, had actually graciously re secured an apartment for us, had had a call in church the weekend before and somebody donated a mattress and a, a bourgeois looking couch and a formica table which we were very grateful for and she dropped us at the apartment and she said look I'll be back in an hour we have one fast food restaurant um, we'll take we're gonna take you out for dinner and they closed the door and I looked at Rene and uh, <laughs> you know just the, I mean that, that, anyway, so, anyway so we get through that period of time and then you have to settle into life in northern Saskatchewan. And she volunteered. She couldn't work. I was on a temporary work visa. She volunteered in the library. She taught gymnastics. I mean, she went to her, her gym classes. I mean, she was always incredibly fit. And the one day, as happens in every marriage, we had a disagreement. We had a discussion. And she wasn't happy. With, I, I didn't ask me what it was about. And she got in the car, she was mad at me, she walked out, took the keys and got in the car and started driving. Now, Larange is four hours north of Saskatoon and there is nothing between Larange and Saskatoon. And she got halfway down the freeway and she realized, well, can't go to dad, you know, better turn around. And she said for years after that, she said the worst thing was when she came back into the apartment, I was standing there with my hips, on my hands on my hips and said, so where did that get you? <laughs> Yeah, so she never let me live that down. But anyway, we survived a year and a half, almost two years in northern Saskatchewan, decided we're coming to America, got a job in, in Wilmington, Delaware. She worked in radiation therapy. You know, I did my residency. And the one story I remember her telling me was that she met a, an elderly teacher that had been married for over 50 years. 
and you know she was treating this patient very compassionately with with the radiation therapy and she said to the woman you know 50 years i mean that's an incredible amount of time how you know how, how do you how do you make it work and the woman looked at her and said you know marriage is something you have to work at every day she says not work like work but don't ever take your partner for granted you know it's marriage is not 50 50 it's 40 60 one time 70 30 30 70 whatever but it's something you need to be aware of and work at every single day and i thought those are pretty wise words that we we try to live by that fast forward we decide we're not staying on the east coast we love the family in atlanta but i could not go and work in, you know in atlanta and those of us who knew us just said go to the northwest I flew out here one January. I met my other wife, you know, Denise Kraft, who's been my partner of 32 years. Um, never had a bad word in 32 years. Most amazing human being. Um, offered me a job. Um, and, you know, I f called her from where the, what's that, Ivory Tower, Bellatini, or wherever the, you know, that place on next to the highway is one of the malls there. It was an old... Um, stayed in a motel there that I could see the Cascade Mountains from, from the balcony. And obviously, they tore everything down. You now I built the, that big uh, mall there. And I said to her, I don't know where I've come. I said, I've met the most amazing you know, providers, partners. I said, I'm coming to Seattle. I mean, she'd never been to Seattle, just trusted. You know, and I flew her out in May. Thank God it was a sunny week. She loved the warm weather. <laughs> you could tell from the plot that I chose for us that, you know, I chose a very sunny spot because she loved this, the sunshine. You know, and we came, we came, we literally had a dog it was called um, Muffin and the three of us got in the car and we drove across country and never looked back. Um, arrived in Seattle, settled into life, wanted to start a family, had a lot of issues with fertility, failed fertility after fertility decide we're taking a break because the doctor was going on vacation and she didn't want to see somebody else and the next month she was pregnant and nine months later uh, you know, Elle was born um, miracle child um, and she loved to be a mother you know she she enjoyed her time as radiation therapy she worked as you know as a dental a dental chair um, orthodontist but she loved being a mother she loved running the home she loved you know, being with the kids, she, had, she was not a career oriented woman. It allowed me selfishly to go to work and do my job and take care of my patients and know that I'd come home to a cooked meal and, you know, a clean home and somebody taking care of our kids. And then as things would happen, we couldn't, you know, get pregnant again. And we decided to go down the adoption route. And today, 22 years ago, Mark was born. 23. Are you 23? <laughs> okay, I'm a, I'm a bit vermissed. Okay, 23 years ago, we flew to Dallas. You know, met met Mark, um, brought him home to Seattle. Come to you know find out through. I'm not going to go into the whole detail. You all know about this the, re the reconciliation of me calling my birth family and finding my whole new family. And Max and Lynette have a 61st wedding anniversary today. I mean, all the, the, the memories on March 31st, I mean, I don't think Mark will ever forget the day his mother was, was buried, obviously, Max and Lynette Mazeltov in 61 years and hopefully many happy, healthy years ahead. And it's, it's been a fairy tale, you know, we've just, you know, had this whole new family come into our lives, you know, raising the kids, you know, getting on with life and, and living you know, the golden years is now that I look back on in the, in the 40s and the 50s. And, and all those of you know Renee, I mean, she was the healthiest person I knew. She, she exercised regularly. She, you know, occasional, occasional McDonald's. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, never had any health issues. Never, once a year physical, never took any medications. I mean, just the, the, the healthiest person I knew. Um, and, you know, playing tennis, play, hanging out with the Mahjong girls, uh, meeting her tennis buddies and I know here back then going to Indian Wells with them and just you know living life to the fullest you know and she lived life to the fullest um, and we always said you know life is short you know we don't know what's happening tomorrow 
And then, unfortunately, two and a half years ago, you know, developed some weird neurological process problem. I'm not going to go into all the medical details. And six months later, which is basically two years from now, was diagnosed with this very rare chronic form of, of, of leukemia. And, uh, you know, initially we debated about what to do. Um, in hindsight, you know, maybe we didn't make the right decision, but, uh, you know, that's water under the bridge. We waited a year to see how things progressed, and then a year ago, when it was clear things were not heading in the right direction, we decided to go down the transplant route. And I was unaware that there is an international registry. Um, so anybody who develops leukemia and they do all these blood tests, they enter the, your blood cells into an international data bank. And we went to meet with a transplant oncologist, um, a very handsome guy, Dr. Felipe Milano. And she you know, made it hard, easier for her to go through this whole long, hard discussion with this guy, even though behind the mask, I mean, he, he was clearly a very good-looking Italian guy, uh, very compassionate. Um, and he opens up a file, and he's, you know, his head recoiled. It's like, where are you from? It's like, what is your background? Because she had 89 12 for 12 matches. I mean, 12 for 12, they're the genetic matches, which is... I mean, I don't think I'd ever seen anything like it. And the top three matches were all in Israel. Um, so he said, look, you're going to be fine. We're going to get this thing done. We're going to start the process. And long short is that we teed up for her to, to undergo the transplant you know, in October. And the war in Israel breaks out. So now we're stuck with you know, three perfect, specifically 20-year-old males that they wanted. The first guy fell off the list, unavailable medically. Somehow they were able to contact the second guy um, who agreed to donate the cells. This is now we're talking mid-October, war raging. Somehow they extract the cells from this guy. Somebody hand carried those cells for us to Seattle. And on November 8th, you know, she had the, the bone marrow transplant. And with such, you know, we were so optimistic that this thing was going to work. There was no doubt in my mind. I mean, she was at Fred Hutch. They did the very first, the world's first transplant for Fred Hutch. You know, where better place to be? You're going to get sick. You might as well get sick in a place that's 20 minutes from your home. And, you know, again, not going to go into all the details. She started having complications, landed up in the ICU with septic shock, um, and spent 12 weeks at UW the first time around. And, you know... The physicians, I think, were having a hard time because they, they saw this beautiful, healthy woman <clears throat> that they clearly wanted to help, and there was clearly something else going on. And I know, because I can read the room medically, that they didn't think she was going to make it. And um, she decided to defy all odds, and 12 weeks later, she walked out of that hospital. Um, the entire unit turned out to cheer her on on the day of her discharge. Um, it, was, it was remarkable, you know. And again, came home to, with us believing that, okay, the worst is behind us. You've had this incredibly difficult course, but now we have a path forward. We just have to get you strong. We have to get you healthy. Um, but after a couple of weeks, it became clear that for some reason, the damage done from the initial chemo and radiation had caused permanent irreversible damage to her liver and her gut. And she continued to lose weight. She was having a hard time eating. The outpatient oncologist, now that we had another doctor, was convinced that there was some form of called graft versus host disease. I and mean, we just started throwing pills at her. I mean, she was taking 20 pills a day, which she hated. Um, and I could tell that at that point she was starting to lose steam. Um, never. You know, never gave up per se, um, but three weeks ago when she started vomiting bile and landed back up at UW and they found this blockage in her colon that needed surgery, um, she decided enough's enough. Uh, I, I can't even begin to go there, you know, because most of us mortals who live every day get up, you know, I always say to my patients, you know, never take your body for granted. If any, you, you break a leg, you, you have surgery, you know, the next day, I mean, it's a, everything's a struggle. You can't, you know, get dressed. You've got to have somebody wipe your bum. I mean, it's just, it's, you know, we just take our bodies for granted. So if one of 
appeal for me tonight is, you know, never, ever take your body for granted. Um, but she knew what she did not want. She did not want to die on the operating table. I don't think she would have survived the surgery. Um, she did not want to die in hospital. You know, she wanted to come home. And she, you know, always communicated. We did have a very open relationship. Um, she always communicated things with me, except that I know I got there the one the morning, two days before discharge, and she had already spoken to the the PA about withdrawing care. And I think she was worried that if she spoke to me about it first, that I would try to convince her otherwise. She told me she was scared. Um, but again, her request was for us to bring her home to die. Um, Many of us in primary care have written hospice referrals. I mean, I've done it dozens of times and never th thought about it. And obviously, this took on a whole new meaning um, to do so. And I mean, the hospice team was, was amazing, but they come for 15 minutes a day, you know, and then you with the patient the rest of the time. And it was a very difficult two weeks. I could not have done it without Yale and Mark at my side. Um, up until two days, three days before her, her death, she was having us get her out of bed and going to potty on the commode. Last Friday, in her weakest of state, she hadn't eaten at this point for five weeks. I mean, I'm barely drinking. She had us walk her to the Shabbat, last Shabbat, walk her to the Shabbat table. And she sat there for 15 minutes, went back to bed. Saturday morning, she got us, made us get her up. At that point, she couldn't walk. And we wheeled her with like a little, we had like a little desk chair to the, to the table for her to be able to at least have the, you know, some semblance of normal before she really started to withdraw. And she died peacefully at home, um, as per her wish. And I feel very grateful, you know, that we were able to grant her that wish. But throughout this process, you know, I, again, the support from all of you, from the community, from my office staff, from my patients, um, it takes a village. And I've seen the village working in spades you know, it, it, at, a, at a level that I hoped I would never have to endure. Um, Barbara and Lester don't have the words, helping out with food and meals. And I didn't tell you earlier, when she was in the 12 weeks she was in the hospital, you know, between Lester and Leora bringing baked goods every week, I was concerned that the nurses wouldn't get her well because they wouldn't want her to leave because they were being, they've never been so well fed, you know. Um, so Leora, un un thank you for everything. Um, Gina, there was the magic, the penicillin, chicken broth, the bone broth was the one thing that she would constantly ask for um, as she became harder for her to eat. Uh, Deborah, I, I mean, Deborah, where, I don't know where you are. Thank you. I, you know, they were my rock. At one point, I was able to go back to work for a couple of weeks, and those three of her closest 